My name is Adam Iraminko, and I'm the founder of Zero Tier and the original author of The Core. Um, I'm going to give you a short demo of Zero Tier in action, the way you install it, and some of the things you can do with it. So I'll just say one of the issues we sometimes have with demos and zero tier is that the demo is too short uh, because you don't have to do a lot of things to install this. I don't have to type cryptic commands for a half hour. Um, right now, I am just uh, SSHing into some systems that I am going to use as nodes in a tiny simulated multi-cloud uh, installation. For the demo, I'm going to show you what you would do to set up a simple network um, and then do a few things on that network. And this is a participatory demo. If anyone in the audience has zero tier uh, installed or wants to go get it, um, you'll be able to try this out too. So if you have zero tier, uh, this is a public network. So I, I went ahead and turned off access control on it. If you join that network, um, you can, uh, join the same network that I'm using for the demo. And uh, you know you could uh, try some of those things. I'll go back to that slide in a, in a minute. This is the, so when you log into Zero Tier, this is actually my account on myzerotier.com. You uh, get to this place where you can basically just say, create a network. When you create a network, um, and this is for our managed controllers. If you're hosting a controller locally, you have to configure it with config files and stuff, but um, you can create a network. I already made one, which is this network. Uh, this is one my kids use to play Minecraft. Uh, this is our company intranet, uh, various other things. Okay, so if I go to NFD demo, there's that network ID again. Um, I actually set it to public. And then you can configure some stuff that will get pushed down to the nodes as configuration. Now, here's the thing. This is just stuff that for convenience, we uh, let you push down to your nodes for configuration, like giving them IPs. If you wanted to, you could just get a virtual network port and assign the IPs locally and they work. Um, but this is nice. Uh, I enabled that IPv6 six plane thing. You can set a trade-off between uh, for multicast, how many people get multicasts maximum versus how much bandwidth is used. Um, and then you can also configure DNS. Uh, if you have a DNS server on your network, you can tell it the search domain and the IP of that server, and it will uh, configure it locally on the machine. Now, roadmap. Oh, nice. OK, I'll put that ID up there in a second. Um, roadmap. Uh, DNS is just getting started with us. Um, this is kind of the minimum viable product. Uh, you can push down some DNS config. We also have an open source project that we made called Z, uh, Zero NSD that will take the node names you configure in central and advertise and answer DNS queries on your network for them. I see a lot of people already <laughs> joined. Great. Okay. So do you so do you do you support? Do you support uh, mapping MDNS or link local multicast oh, name resolution? Not mapping. Uh, multicast is supported, so MDNS will work. Um, well, me I meant mapping into the mapping into your DNS name service within. The oh, Zero -tier that that's an interesting idea. I'll I'll bookmark that. Um, we hadn't thought about gluing MDNS to conventional DNS as a as a feature. I didn't know anyone wanted to do that. Thank you. Um, let me, so, so the only reason the only reason I brought up the MDNS is because of the fact that it's routable. You can do some interesting things in terms of using this to be able to route traverse around MDNS broadcast range, right? Because that's a problem for for many folks that are dealing with wireless networks where you can't reach the resource like you're trying to uh, screen share to an Apple TV, but it's actually on a different VLAN, right? So the wireless controller has to map through the MDNS services in order for you to be able to discover them or use them. So it's a really interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting use case because, right, it's it's obviously if it's layer three routable, uh -huh. MDNS works fine, but it doesn't go beyond the multicast scoping of, of you know, MDNS being, you know, multicast, you know, within the link, link local. So. So, yeah, everybody can get on there. And then if you have MTD and uh, if you have um, MDNS, DT dash demo dash zero one and then zero, two, zero, three. So I have three nodes. Let's pretend this is multi-cloud. Um, I'm gonna go, uh, and if you telnet to ZT demo 02, 
which is this IP address, you can play the original BSD game, Hunt the Wampus, uh, which is running on there if you tell it to it. All right, let's go terminal. Okay, so I have three nodes. Um, hope you guys can see that. I'm actually gonna make the font a little bigger even. All right. Um, okay, so one of these nodes, uh, just to be exotic, one of them is, this one's in Mexico City. The second one is in my basement. And the third one is in South Africa to be, uh, let's see, there we go. And uh, this one's at a ISP called Vulture. This one's in my basement. This one is at EC2. So again, it doesn't matter. Um, if we were setting this up to start with, we would install zero tier, which there's instructions on our download page, takes five seconds. Uh, and uh, then we would join that network, which is this guy. Now I already did that on these for in interest of time, but now we're on Z zero tier NFD demo. Now, Okay, let me, let me cut and paste here. Let me see if I can move that. Um, let me cut and paste. This is the six plane IP. So let me ping six that and I can, oh, oh, it's got the slash. And I can ping that from my basement or from Mexico City. So, um, That's MDNS, MDNS works. I have all these machines uh, running Avahi and advertising. Um, the machine in Mexico City is pinging my laptop. Um, don't install malware on my laptop if you have a uh, Mac OS zero day. <laughs> uh, so one of the things I wanted to do is, okay, we have our pretend multi-cloud here. Um, I will run a example cluster of something I really nice call, uh, that I really like called um, called cockroach DB. Um, I created these for the sake of time. They have the IPs of the other nodes already set up, uh, listen address and join. And so if I go to the second ones, okay. And uh, back here, oh, wait. And then uh, if I go to it in the web browser, I can see that I now have, hmm. Hmm. I will have, Oh yeah, here we go. A uh, three node uh, fault tolerant distributed um, somewhat Postgres-like database uh, running in three different time zones. And I just did that in a few seconds. Um, let's see. And uh, if we wanted to add more nodes, so if, if any of you are joined to the zero tier network, you could go to 172.27.20.33 colon 8080 and see this as well. Um, this is just an example. There's a lot of stuff out there. Like I said, there's a Terraform. Uh, there's a Terraform integration. There's, you know, th this could have 500 nodes on it. It could be in 20 different data centers, and the experience is essentially the same. Um, go back to this for a second. One of the things that was, that was interesting to me is the underlay can change dynamically because, in the, you know, if you're on IPv4 and the underlay, it'll ride IPv4. If you're on IPv6, whatever you have that you've configured in your zero tier mm -hmm. network will ride you know, natively over IPv6. And I think, and this is where I wanted a clarification, mm -hmm. if I've seen it, if I have a node, because we use zero tier in, in my company and I see this all the time in our controller, if you're on IPv6 on one side, but your other network you're trying to get to has IPv4, it can still figure that out too. Yeah. If one's yeah. on V6 it and one's will. on V4. And that's yeah. a really hard trick to do with overlays and underlays. I don't uh, know anything else that does that. Yeah, uh, VL1 does that. Um, and like I said, uh, from a technical point of view, VL1 hides that from the upper layers. So layer two just sees a flat network. Um, so yeah, I'm just pinging across this. Uh, MDNS works because multicast and broadcast works. Now the next part of this demo that I wanna do 
is I want to show. Now, do I have this? If you're, quick oh. question: If you are manually okay. configuring stuff, will all the will all the solic <clears throat> will all the neighbor discovery, uh, all the duplicate address detection portions for V6, all of those related components will work properly because they're using the multicast and solicited you know, multicast addresses to to do that work. So you're still going to discover if you've got a duplicate address, even if you manually. Yes. Configure. Uh, anything that works on a LAN should just work. Now, if you're having zero tier um, actually do the addressing for you, it of course isn't going to give you one. But if you have something else doing the addressing, yes, right. that should work. Okay. So now I'm going to demonstrate something else. So, okay. So I'm already seeing this. this oh, oh, this is my this is my web browser. I'm actually going to close the cockroach DB uh, thing because I don't want this to pollute the screen over here. So what I did is on my laptop, I told TCP dump to show me TCP SYN and RST packets on that LAN. Now I'm going to go over here to the rules engine. And I've already put it in here for the sake of time. I'm just going to uncomment it. Um, oh, SYN and FIN but same idea. Uh, I'm just going to uncomment this. And what that is, is it, it's a little small, so I'll read it off. Uh, T128, and then the zero tier address of my laptop, uh, char packet characteristic TCP SYN or, T or characteristic TCP FIN and characteristic inbound. I did inbound because if I don't do that, each node will send it to me on exit and each node will send it to me on receipt and I'll get two copies of each packet. Now, if you wanted to be thorough, you could actually have one security observer watching only the inbound and another one watching not inbound. And you could use that to detect any asymmetry in, in enforcement of that. Um, but I am going to say save changes. And now, if anyone's playing on this network, um, OK, uh, I'm watching TCP connections. Let's see. Yeah, 195 to this. If anyone wants to, yeah, 1234, there we go. Anyone's playing on this network, I'm watching your TCP connections in real time. Um, and I'm not having to man in the middle of the traffic and I'm not having to get all the traffic. Now, if I eliminate the selectivity from this rule and I just say, give me the first 128 bytes of every packet inbound, I go over here. Now I'm really getting a lot of stuff because a lot of people are apparently playing around on this LAN. So there's uh, there's your security tap. This is coming to my laptop. So sitting in here, tethered to my phone, I did phone tethering because I don't trust hotel Wi-Fi for this. I am a security monitor for this network and can watch in real time. An IT person could do this in the field in real time. You could be sitting in Starbucks and you could decide you want to tap your network and check something out. There you go. Um, and this is tapping the virtual network. I don't get any insight into VL1. Technology roadmap. Um, one of the one of the weaknesses we have now is VL1 does this magic peer-to-peer -peer routing. Um, however, when it doesn't work, you still have to go and get into things through some other method and uh, actually go in and try to diagnose what's going on. Um, remote diagnostics, remote logging, remote uh, you know the ability to remotely query nodes on a network and get their VL1 status info is on the roadmap. I know you guys, you guys run a really high MTU, which is another thing that, that really, uh, you know, set it apart. Cause we actually run MPLS over zero tier when we need to extend an MPLS network, we'll run MPLS. Oh, what, what led you guys to choose that MTU and you actually can send those packets without fragmenting. So if you need to send a 1500 byte packet, you can set the DF bit and it's going to get through or higher mm -hmm. if you want it. What, how did you guys, how did you guys do that exactly? Uh, as far as, you know, being able to take that and do that over the internet. So um, it actually does fragment, VL1 does that. So uh, when, when I was designing this, I had a choice. I could either uh, restrict the MTU to um, the maximum UDP packet that will reliably, underscore reliably, traverse the internet uh, minus the overhead, um, or I could implement fragmenting in VL1. I implemented fragmenting in VL1. So from VL2's point of view, um, you can send up to, I think the limit is 10,000 bytes in a VL1 packet, and it just makes it. 
Now, the default is 2800. That default was chosen because that divides neatly into two packets with very little wasted space uh, on, their, on their MTU, which um, that was just chosen empirically by doing benchmarks. And I found that going higher than that, if you have a little bit of packet loss makes things, of course, you amplify the lossage. If you go lower than that, you're actually doing more work to process the packets. So that was the sweet spot for, for performance was to have the default be a 2800. You can change that. You can go up to, I think the MTU inside the network, you can set as high as 9,000, but uh, check the docs. Uh, by the way, there's a site, uh, docs.zerotier.com. Uh, I want to do a shout out to Joseph, one of our engineers who's mostly responsible for that, and Travis, who's done a lot of other work on that, and the rest of the team. Um, I didn't write a lot of documentation. I'm, I'm a hacker, and I wrote the thing, and of course, everyone should just telepathically know how it works. So they, uh, they made some great docs for us. Um, <laughs> And we're not cool enough to have no docs, no developer docs like Apple. If we were a multi-billion dollar company, we could do that. 